I'm Eric Smalling. I'm a developer advocate at Sneak. Um, and Alba? I'm Alba Ferri. I'm a senior product marketing manager at Sysdig. And we are here today to talk about vanquishing vulnerabilities here in, vulner in, in Valencia. Yeah. Not in vulnerability. We're not in vulnerability. <laughs> um, quick agenda. Just uh, We don't have a lot of time, so hopefully I don't go too fast. Uh, we're going to first talk, we'll quickly talk some terminology, but I think everyone here knows what a lot of that is. Um, then I'm going to get right into a demonstration of a remote code execution. Um, I'm going to demonstrate a log4j, log4shell uh, exploit so that you can see, if you've not seen it before, how ridiculously easy it is to do. And then uh, we're going to talk about some proactive measures you can use to minimize blast radius for vulnerabilities like that you, that you didn't see coming, zero days or things that were just, uh, that you don't know if you have or not. And then Alba's going to talk then about uh, detecting that kind of behavior for anything that slips by so that you can be alerted should something be happening in your cluster. So as I said, most of this terminology everybody in this room understands. The main one um, I'm going to talk about today for at least my side of the talk is mitigation. Countermeasures you can use to prevent a threat or at least reduce its impact to you in the real world. So enough talk and slides. Let's uh, get to a demo. So what you're seeing here is a uh, J2, let me set the scene kind of, we have a J2EE application, two tier, it's got a front end that's uh, obviously written Java, and then a uh, MySQL back end running in separate pods on a Kubernetes cluster out in EKS, and please conference Wi-Fi, stay working, otherwise we'll have to drop to a recording, and I hate doing that. So uh, on the center here we have Octant running, just monitoring the logs of this Java application, and then on the left you'll see what's going to happen over there in a minute. So I'm going to sign into my application. And of course, my 1Password has locked out. So here we go. This is oh, un momento, por favor. Clear my uh, session out. Try that again. So we're going to log in. Proof that I'm doing it live. So this, again, is just a simple application. If you've seen any of my talks before, you've probably seen this. Uh, it's just a to-do list. And if I search for something you know, like a, a car to-do, You'll see that uh, it finds that and it shows the car. And if I come back over here, and again, live demos, let me refresh this page. Sometimes Octant loses its connection when uh, Wi Fi goes in and out. Oops. Ah, come on, Octant. There we go. Logs. Okay, well, Octant's not going to cooperate with me, so we'll just open another terminal and do this the good old fashioned way. Logs, follow, Java goof. Come on, autocomplete. Remember what I said about conference Wi-Fi? There we go. Good grief. Not found. I must have bounced my pod since I did that last. There we go. There we go. Ignore the errors before that. Uh, again, so we see searching for car has happened. Ignore all this other stuff from the test runs I've done. But what, we're, what we have here is the application is very likely logging what we do as we go along. All of our applications do that. What the interesting thing about the log4j vulnerability, if you aren't, you know, we haven't looked into what it was and why it's so pernicious, is that it allowed a JNDI or Java naming discovery interface lookup um, using an LDAP external server. And what happens is you come in here, and I'm going to use this and copy the string because it's easier than typing it. It allows me to insert something here. Instead of a normal string to search for, I'm searching for an interpolated thing. So you've got to grow that font for you. I've got a curly, a dollar curly brace, and then I've got the protocol for LDAP, and I'm pointing to this LDAP server somewhere on a dark web domain call it with a um, context of a remote shell. Now, before I start that, I'm going to go to this other tab over here. And this is just another instance running in EC2 somewhere. It doesn't uh, matter where it is. I'm just listening with Natcat on port 9000 in this case. Now, if I hit go here, you see a connection has happened. I do an LS. I now have a shell into the Tomcat server that is running on that, um, that, that application is running in. I can pull my environment. So I can see all sorts of nice information there, including the fact that I'm in a Kubernetes cluster because of all the environmental variables that fit that. There's all sorts of meat juicy information here I can get at. I can get at the internal uh, IP of the API server for the control plane in this cluster. Um, let's see what else I can see. Let's do a DF. 
hey, it looks like uh, since this is pre-124 Kubernetes, the default service account token might be out there. So let's copy that and see if I can see that. Slash token, and there it is. So I can start as a bad actor, start expanding my exploit. Remote code execution exploits happen. They, they, you're gonna have them occasionally. Uh, that's why, A, you need to stay patched, and it's obviously important to scan your code, scan your containers, make sure that as they come up, you're patching those and getting them out of the way. But as, as happened with many companies with this exploit in, in December, they were caught off guard. It happened so fast, and so many people were vulnerable that everyone was scrambling to figure out, do I have this problem? And what the heck do I do before I can get this patch out the door? So um, what are some of the other things I can do here? Um, I could use that to try going after the, the API, but who am I? Let's see what uh, user I'm. Oh, I'm root, that's handy. If you didn't know, many open source official images out on the main uh, uh, registries do default in Docker containers. By default, default to root user. You sh well, we'll get into why, why that's good or bad in, in a minute. Uh, let's see, can I touch a file in a directory and do an lsltr on Etsy? Yes, I just created a foo. If you can see that's at the bottom of the screen. I created a foo file in the Etsy directory. This tells me not only, do, A, yes, I am root and I have the ability to do that, it's a read-write file system in this container, so I can do things to it. Let's say, let's see if I can run nmap, oops, if I can type. Oh, come on, Wi-Fi. So I have nmap available, that's cool. Um, let's see if I have curl available, just while I'm typing thing. Uh, let's do, I don't know, Google. That's always a good one to check. And yes, so I have curl available at my disposal. I happen to have nmap on this box. This is because I was hacking on it earlier, honestly. That wasn't supposed to already be there. Let's pretend N nmap wasn't there. I wonder if I can even just do this. Yes, so I have access to app repositories, whether they be on the internet or some you know, company internal. Um, so I can start expanding my exploit very easily on this machine. Um, so as I said, let's say you're at this company and you're freaking out now because this exploit has come out in December and you're trying to figure out, well, what, could have ha well, you know, what do I need to do? Well, if you, there's some mitigation things you could have done ahead of time to minimize a lot of what I just showed you. First of all, uh, this, uh, the image I'm using, if I were to go look at the Docker file, this is an official Tomcat image at version whatever. And that you would think would have, you know, the JDK, the bits of the uh, distribution, but it's also gonna have things like curl, as you saw. Uh, it's got bash in there, it's got wgit, it could even have vim, who knows what all is in this thing. It's a very fat container, and by being a fat container, you're giving a lot of tools to bad actors to use against you. What you really wanna do is try to stick to smaller image sizes to start with. You ideally just want the open JDK. Now, maybe you wanna have a shell in there for things that you need to run as part of your startup or whatever, but minimize that image size down so you're not providing tools to the, uh, to the bad actors. Uh, to do this, there are many, uh, there's too many things to talk about in this, the short time we have today, but you can look at slim images, you could look at distroless images from the Google open source folks. Those are very minimal images. Um, just make sure they work for your team. You don't wanna go to distroless and then I'll say, oh, I need this other tool, and then you've gotta build it from binary and include it yourself and become sysadmins as developers. That's not always the best solution, but find the right solution that minimizes uh, the, the image size. Understand how layers work. If you're new to containers, uh, you might think that I can just put it, uh, a run rm curl and get rid of that curl. That's not how it works. It just hides it in the images. And if somebody were, like in yesterday's CPF demonstration, somebody were to start up a privileged container, I now can mount the host file system very, very easily and get at those hidden layers that are in the uh, var run container D whatever directories. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna hurry up here. Uh, practice good build strategies. If you're, a, if you're using Docker files, use multi-stage builds so that your final stage can be as minimal as you, want, you can make it. Uh, in most places, you wanna have repeatable builds so that every time you build from a given commit hash, you get the same image out so it's predictable and deterministic. And look at alternative tools. If you're a Java shop, I'm a big fan of JIB, which is a 100% Java-based uh, image building tool that you can put right into your Maven or Gradle tools. If you're in Go, look at Ko, K-O. Uh, there's a, a bunch of other tools you could be using that you can really standardize to your organization's needs. 
And then finally, there is entire conferences dedicated to this now. I can't go into secure supply chain in two seconds, but what I want to mention here is you want to make sure that wherever your images are coming from, you have an audit trail for them, a chain of custody, if you will, and only automation should be putting those images into whatever managed registries you're using. Eric's Docker build-based image should never be being shipped to anybody, anywhere that's important. Um, now, let's talk about actual things you can do to minimize what I did there beyond smaller images. Um, don't run as root in your containers. Uh, it, it's very, very rare that you need, and especially in business e-commerce type applications, that you need to have a root user running your application. You might have something very specific, and that's a, a topic we could talk about at the booth later, but um, you probably don't need it, so switch to a lower privilege user, because when you're UID zero in a container, even though you're contained, your UID zero. And if you can break out into the file system of the host, as you can, uh, you, you can imagine what you can do. Uh, privileged containers, as we saw yesterday again in the CTF uh, training, uh, if you've got a privileged container, you own the box. Uh, you have uh, access to mount devices from the root, you all sorts of stuff. Just, unless you're like Falco <laughs> or, or something that needs privilege access, you don't need privilege. Uh, Linux capabilities are the same kind of a thing. Most business applications can safely drop all capabilities just add back the ones you need. If you, if you can't run without uh, netcap add for some reason, figure out why you need that, because that's kind of odd for a business app. But just add the uh, capabilities you need. And then finally, the read-only uh, root file system. Being immutable is a good thing in many ways. It's not, none of these are silver bullets, but it does make life harder. I would not have been able to run apt, get, update, or install, or any of those kinds of tools if I'm trying to modify, mutate a file system that's read-only from the beginning. Um, so, but the big one I want to really hit on is network policy. And a lot of us in security discussions don't really, we kind of ignore network policy, or for developers like myself, the first time I look at network policy, I'm like, I'm not a network admin. I don't understand how to do firewalls. I don't, I mean, it's, it's not that hard. Network policy is one of my favorite tools. And for Log4j, it was a, it's a great way to minimize the blast radius, because what was the happy path of what should have been happening was user hits web app, web app hits DB. That's the network path that should be happening. But what's really happening is the web app is then sending a connection out to an LDAP server or a quasi LDAP server, FO1, and then it is returning and, and then calling another HTTP server that's returning an a, a evil object, which in turn is then calling back out to some port somewhere. In this case, it was my other EC2 instance. Those orange connection lines should not be happening. Network policy allows you to specify ingress and egress rules for TCP, UDP across your, your deployment. And you can just say, hey, using selectors, what, can, what pods can and can't talk to each other? I'm a fan of the deny all style pattern where you start with nothing working. Everything is broken. Obviously, the app doesn't work here, but no ingress or egress from the pods is allowed. You want to allow DNS, so you have service discovery, but beyond that, nothing is allowed. Then you explicitly just add the rules you need for your application to work. In this case, I need traffic to come in from users, obviously, and I need traffic to leave a web app towards a database, and I need traffic into the database only from the web app. And if you want to see what that would look like if you're new to network policies, I have another tab somewhere. I have too many screens open. Actually, that's this one right here. So I'm not going to go through the minutia of all the, the manifest here, but you can see I've broken this up fairly granular, granularly to be legible, but we have a denial policy that's saying for the empty pod selector, meaning all the pods in whatever namespace I deploy this to, ingress, egress. Ingress, the empty list, means no ingress to anything. Egress, the only uh, egress you're allowed is to port 53. In real world, I'd be more specific than this to say the kube DNS, but for this demo, that's what I have. Then uh, we want to egress to, from the Java goof web app only to, I'm sorry, ingress, only to port 8080. That's where my Tomcat server is listening. And then finally, we want to say egress out of the Java web app to the Java DB. Now again, I could be more specific and say ports and whatnot. And then similarly, into the Java DB from the Java web app. And if we apply that, let me quit out of that and do a K apply. K is alias to kubectl because I'm lazy. And denial. If I apply this, and I have no idea what my time is. Hopefully, I'm not yeah. using all your time. <laughs> um, in fact, I'm worried about time. If I apply that now, if, if I go over back to my uh, web app and just hit this again, what you're going to see is it's spinning now. That orange line coming out of this box here is now blocked. 
And anybody attacking, yes, I'm still vulnerable, but I've mitigated and I've shrunk that blast radius. Now I've turned an RCE into a potential denial of service, maybe if they machine gun me right now and eat up a whole bunch of threads, but it's still better than somebody having a shell in my, in my, my cluster. So simple things like that can be done to help uh, mitigate these things. And finally, enforce these kinds of things I'm talking about with something like either OPA Gatekeeper, Kyberno, Pod Security Admission is the new one coming in, next release. Uh, if you're using PSPs, that's great, but they're deprecated, move to one of these. And with that, I am going to hand over to Alba, because we're running out of time. Thank you. OK. So with the time that I have left, I'm going to be talking. Can you hear me fine? Is it working? Yeah. I'm going to be talking about detecting errant behavior. Um, all those uh, security controls and best practices that Eric walk us through are super valuable when we want to um, uh, minimize the blind radio, when we want to uh, protect our applications. Um, dev teams should really pay attention to all of these advices when they are building the applications, like not running containers as root if you can, dropping capabilities, not leaving uh, network tools that hackers can use in case they break in, and also using admission controller as a last frontier before sending applications to production. Uh, but many of those um, are or apply better in the development lab, uh, phases of the application lifecycle, and that is what is known in the field as uh, chief security lab. Um, but to detect errant behavior, uh, we want to look at the other side of the infinite loop. We want to uh, look at uh, productive environments. Here is where we want to detect errant behavior, when we have our workloads running in production. Um, before we knew the Log4j library had such a big vulnerability, or even the most recent one, the Spring for Shell, we didn't know our applications were at risk, right? Uh, well, actually, many of the applications running in productive environments right now are affected by vulnerabilities, but they are still uh, hidden or haven't been detected yet, right? So how can we uh, be sure that we are protected? How can we shield right? Um, we said in the beginning when we were going through the uh, terminology that a thread is a path, a theoretical path, a way that a vulnerability is exploited. And we show in the demo uh, that uh, how, how to exploit the log4j vulnerability. So it became a real threat, right? Um, we saw processes opening a reversal in a container and um, using network tools like Nmap, well, in this case, it wasn't there, but Nmap and Curl, whatever. We saw processes uh, writing below sensitive folders and even the access of application repositories, right? So um, we need to find ways to uh, detect this suspicious activity. So that's how we can uh, find out that we are being attacked, right? So in order to shift right, to protect our environment, uh, we need to be very aware of this errant behavior. Uh, but also, uh, we need to know what is the normal uh, way our workloads uh, behave, right? And when we think on containerized applications, well, we add that layer of abstraction, uh, maybe two or three layers if you're using Kubernetes, right? But that's uh, why they are so easy to use. Uh, at, in the same time, we have uh, caveats, which is that limited visibility doesn't let us, you know, see it through as, as good as we could in a normal host, right? So, um, uh, the, the, if we know what are the normal conditions of our workloads, we could be alerted with that, when that uh, behavior deviates from what is normal. Um, so uh, for that, you can use um, threat detection engine like Falco, right? Falco is the first 
runtime security project that joined the CNCF uh, in an incubation level project. Um, it works in a streamlined fashion way, and you can use it as a kernel module or eBPF program, and it is built on top of two open source libraries. Let's see if I can pronounce them. Libscap, that's the easy one, and Libsins. <laughs> uh, these libraries let you intercept all the activity happening in a host, and then using uh, rules and, and filters, you can send it to the uh, rules engine, right? Because um, that is what we need. We, we need to uh, be alerted as soon as suspicious activity happens in your production environment. Uh, we need this real-time detection, right? And um, Falco comes with a lot of um, default rules out of the box. And talking about the four rules, can I ask you, Eric, to pull out the messages that we had uh, while doing the demo? Because we didn't tell you, but we had a Falco uh, installation in the same cluster. So let's see if we find anything. Uh, it's going to fail. I'm just going to pull a recording of when we did this before. OK. So you can see it. So yeah, here uh, we have. Uh, the notice known system binary send network uh, traffic, and that is when we send the NGI uh, stream string in the web search form, right? And then I think we also had uh, the right below ETC, two or three lines uh, below that, and also when we were accessing the, the application repository. So just with, the, with this um, out of the box rules, you can start detecting uh, suspicious activity. I think we can go back to the slides. Okay, <clears throat> so yeah. Um, but what happens if you want to detect suspicious activity that uh, is not included in the activity that is happening in a host, right? Uh, because at the end, vulnerability exploits can affect a wide range of targets, okay? So um, let's say you want to monitor config changes that could be suspicious in a cloud account, okay? That information is not in the syscalls. Um, so for, to extend Falco uh, behavior, uh, they release a very cool functionality called the Falco plugins. Falco plugins are shared libraries that let us add different data sources and filtering fields so we can use the same Falco rules engine to detect suspicious activity happening in other environments, right? So um, let's say that a hacker finds your cloud credentials in a GitHub repo. I know this is very unlikely to happen, but let's pretend. So with that information, a lot of damage can be done, right? Or even better, let's say that uh, a hacker exploit a vulnerability that is in your workloads. So it becomes a real threat again. Uh, and then using lateral movement techniques, they jump to the cloud account. Um, so having those credentials, they can spin up a new uh, cluster, they can create additional users for later use, or they can even access sensitive information that you may be storing in your buckets. So um, these are also threats at runtime, right? I don't know if you remember uh, the Okta bridge that it happened two months ago. Uh, for those of you who do not know Okta, it's an identity provider, it's the one that uh, avoids us to be able to log in every time we change uh, an application within uh, our, our environment, well, um, the community knew about the um, Falco plugin, so they released a new plugin that you can use the Okta uh, log events, so you can detect if suspicious activity is going on. So if you're an Okta user and um, you wonder if your credentials were um, compromised, you can use the plugin to see if something weird is still going on in your, in your account, right? Uh, so everyone can write their own plugin, pretty easy. 
And then for my last slide, I want to go back to the vulnerability topic here. Uh, when I was presenting Falco, I said that it's built on top of two open source libraries. Well, you can use those libraries um, as a baseline for very cool projects. And if you want to know more about these projects, uh, talk to me after. Uh, but today, I'm just bringing one of the possibilities. And it is using those libraries as a runtime intelligence uh, data source. Runtime intelligence is a technique that brings uh, intelligence, knowledge about the behavior of the software, of the workloads at runtime, right? So with that, you uh, can get information about the commands that are being used, packages, libraries that are loaded in memory. So if you deal with the vulnerability nightmare, right, of having to fix vulnerabilities and, and um, prioritize different tasks, maybe it's a good idea you take this in consideration because uh, it will help you um, prioritizing risk and just focusing on what you really uh, need to, to fix, right? It can ask, it can answer things like, um, for all the libraries that you have in an application, how many of those are really loaded in memory? Because at the end, there are not as many as we think. And then for the ones that are loaded in memory, how many of those have an actual exploit? Because sometimes CVEs are published more like a theoretical thread, but in reality, there's no exploit on this. So just focus on the ones that can really pose a risk to your workloads. And uh, also, um, when we think about fixing vulnerabilities, what we need is like a new fix, a new package version, right? So again, if that uh, package that is loaded in memory that has an exploit, if it doesn't have a fix, I'm not saying you should forget, but you can use that information to you know, clear some of the noise that you have in your uh, super long list of vulnerabilities to fix. And with that, I think we're yeah. done and we made it. <laughs> okay, thank you very thank much. You. <laughs> Were we fine? Any, yeah, yeah, this was a really nice talk. Uh, any questions from the audience? I think we have time for maybe a couple of questions. Well, we'll be our, we will be in our booths uh, throughout the week, so yeah. we're right next to each other, sneaking and Sotig, so come see us. Yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Alba.